supposed to meet this next guy um, coming up. I forget what they call him. Welcome back to SpartanUpPodcast.com. Here we are in Pittsfield, Vermont at Muddy's. Used to be Putty's, then it became Maddie's, kind of became Muddy's. Yeah, we hybridized. It's a cool story. Yeah. So uh, we'll tell that sometime. We, uh, we shall. And I'm surrounded by great people here. We've got Mary and our producer behind the camera there. I have uh, Dave DeLuca to my left. He's become a resident philosopher, actually. Everyone sort of finds their niche. Dr. Johnny, philosopher Dave. Niche or Sephra, niche the, the wild woman. Oh, hello. I like that one. Thank and you. Uh, just, just Joe. Just Joe. Just Joe. But hey, Joe, um, I'm really fascinated by this. I'm, I'm looking at the show notes, and uh, I, yeah, it says I, that this guy's a man whisperer. I got to say, I, was, I didn't know what, 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 what yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know why am I meeting a man whisperer. <laughs> I don't want any man whispering to me. But, um, but it was really, really interesting. It got, um, it woke me up a bit, and I think it's going to wake anybody up out there listening. So, so definitely worth uh, the 15, 20 minutes. So we are here for Spartan Up the Podcast. We're with Kenny Marmorella de Cruz, if I said that correctly. Yep. Where are you from? Uh, that's a story on its own. I'm a refugee from Uganda, and then we were smuggled out. We were on the death list to the UK. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I know. Wait. It's like that, isn't it? All right, it? wait. Before we get into you being smuggled out, because I didn't know any of this, I was told that you are the man whisperer. The man whisperer. What does that mean? Newsweek wrote a, a chapter about me called The Man Whisperer, because I've been running men's groups for like a dozen years in the UK. Okay. Um, I work with men going through change. and What kind of change? Like, like hairy to not hairy? or what, what? Well, actually, <laughs> it's not that much to do with that. Life change. Right. So some mid-life people, crisis. some could be midlife crisis, some could just be lost, some could be, most of them, my private clients have got everything crossed off their list and they're bucket, not happy. Bu- bucket list. They've yeah. Built, they've got they money, they've got billionaires are not happy. Exactly. And those are exactly the men I work with. So those are mainly private clients and then I get them in a men's group because having things on the outside doesn't always do it. In fact, it rarely does it. It's what's on the inside that counts. The way I feel, the way that maybe I'm healthy or not healthy, I'm present or I'm just surviving something that's not actually going on anymore. So it's getting men I guess turning them from boys into men and getting them present and connected. So for me, I spent most of my life surviving and that didn't leave any room for living because I would make sure that whatever it was that came in my way, I needed to be in control because I knew that if I'm in control, I know how to survive and nothing new is going to happen, but at least I'm not vulnerable. I'm not going to be killed. I'm not going to be humiliated. I'm not going to be abandoned, blah, blah, blah. And I find that with most men is like, I'm, they are surviving something and it could be family stuff it could be school stuff it could be something or other happened in their life but that sets a belief system and that belief system is projected into the world and it could be simply I'm not safe or people think I'm a, a bit of an idiot or people are going to reject me or abandon me and it might be something that's happened in school but then business partners wives any relationships that come up it's the same script that plays out but that people know how to survive so so the script is written at a young age potentially yeah and then that that script is wrapped around all your relationships I guess exactly in in life yeah so rather than being able to meet life and respond it's more like fear life and not only react but push it down the same script it's like I had a PA once and she was a Brilliant, brilliant um, at, what what do you call it, Um, troubleshooting. Brilliant troubleshooter, which meant that she perpetually attracted trouble. What's the point? So I need to... She wanted trouble so she could overcome it. Exactly. Right. That's what she was There are a lot of people that do that, right? Yeah. 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 And again, that survival. It's not living. It's not being present and connected. And for me, coming alive at my edge. If I'm... And I've worked with... I've worked with suicidals and I've been there myself. 
And I know that if I try and think my way through any situation, relationship, work, whatever, the best that I will allow to happen in my life would be the best that's already happened in the past. What's the point of that? I want more. And the only way to be in control of anything, and when I think things through, the bottom line is I want to be in control so I'm safe. The only way I can control everyone and everything is simply remove myself from the situation. Now, if suicide and the same old story is the best I can think through, then time to take a breath, get present and stop thinking, take part. So coming alive at the edge and taking those risks. So, so explain, so uh, you're sitting with a billionaire right now. Yeah. And the billionaire is not happy mm -hmm. with life because he has everything that he thought was going to make him happy. But when he actually got here, he found out, so I'm still not happy. Yeah. What are you doing for him to, or her to become happy? First, I need to find where they're stuck because there will be that place. It's like a pause button in the past. Oh, so you got to go back in the past and find that place that... that Very often. Right. Yeah. So that's one way of going to that place. And generally, in a breath, they can feel it. So if I'm scared or upset or whatever, one breath and in a flash, I'll know exactly where I'm stuck. I'll have a scene or I'll have a feeling and I'll follow the feeling and I'll, I'll, I know that place. And then I need to almost bring that to the present and think it's not demonize it, it's not survive it, it's not make a drama out of it, it's accept it. Right. Because it's fact, accept it and move on. And to accept it, do you need to vocalize it to others and, and come out with it? Some might. It's right. down to the individual. But what happens in the men's groups is basically we get to speak about anything. Um, and it's not all doom and gloom and processing. And hear each other, have a space to be met, and learn from each other. And that's it. Rather than, you know, a lot of people are like, OK, I've got this thing. What's the next thing I need to find to fix? And what the next thing because once I fix everything then I'm allowed to then be happy, happy. then I'll be healthy then I can no come from there and if there's anything to learn in hindsight fine right so and there's another thing that I do that's very very quick it's called voice dialogue and quite simply it's speaking to different parts of a person so I could quite simply ask to speak to the part that's stuck and running the life right now and usually there's some sort of a protector when did the protector show up what's the protector protecting from and that protector will keep this person surviving what's very often missing irrespective of money or power is a man who can meet life at the edge and delegate it to the other parts and it could be you know the athlete the confident one the lover the flirt the whatever but if it's all owned by the protector then nothing's going anywhere apart from same old story groundhog day and repeated yeah i am um, i had a pretty tough upbringing i'm always wondering if there's um some blockages or some stuff going on. So um, I'll have to have you like hypnotize me and, uh, <laughs> and, and see what's going on there. But you can do it conscious, don't need yeah. to hypnotize. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, it's really interesting stuff and it's amazing that there are guys willing to raise their hand and come to you and say, look, I've obviously got something broken and I want to fix it. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. Let's go back into your history and figure out how you how you gained this skill. You were, you started with you grew up in Uganda. Yeah, yeah. So, um, cut a long story short, we got on the death list in Africa. Yeah. So we had to cut ourselves off from our friends, our family. What year? Church. What year was this? Seventy two. 1972. And how old were you in 72? I was eight. You were eight? I was an old eight though. I was a very aware eight and I was a nice Catholic boy um, who was oedipulled by my mother and I, you know, emotionally responsible for people and quite aware. And you know, the golden boy syndrome is wonderful on one hand. On the other hand, it's like not really part of the boys, not really part of the kids, not really part of the men, but the property and the special one by the women. So I was very aware of what was going on generally and used to taking care. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just the way it was. And so, and so 72, you're on the death list, which means they're gonna kill you. 
going to kill the family. We had so people. How do you how do you find out at, at that point that you're on a list? Well, my father had a friend who was in the Secret Service yeah. who basically said, from now, I don't know you, we've never met, you're on the list, get out, get your family out, and that was it. Right. So we were told. Plus, a little while later, we were hanging out at home, and we had a phone call saying, we're going to come and kill you tonight, which was quite a decent warning to give. Yeah, why, and, <laughs> and that was because we had some friends that you got that call? I'm guessing, you know, don't know who these people are. Right. So my father laughed it off. We had big alterations, you know, we needed the property taken care of. So he just made a joke saying, we've got three lines and we're safe and blah, blah, blah. Right. So they phoned back and said, we're not kid kidding, we're going to kill you. Right. So whoever it was was on our side or they had a really weird sense of humor. So um, we left that night, we left and we went into hiding and that and was the end of that life. Left your house, that was yeah. gone. Went, um, and you had, you had sisters, brother? One younger brother. Right. So, so mom and dad are alive. Yeah. You and your younger brother pack up. Didn't really pack up. We were with my aunt and uncle. Had a quick look around in the front and the back of the house and just left. And oh. that was it. Where'd you go? We went up into the, the, the mountains where my aunt and uncle live. So we just, we just left. And the people who worked for us lived up the road, the domestics. Um, they came for us a, a good few times that night. They came for us. But like a phone call? Yeah, right. Like, how decent is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, a good, that's a good phone call to get. I guess. Well, it's a bad phone call, but a good phone call. So we were in hiding, we were followed. There was a lot of how nasty long were stuff. Hiding? Do you know, time is a funny thing. I have no idea. It, right. it was probably a few weeks. Okay. Um, and then the day that we left, no, we left and we left my father there. He was on the death list and he was wanted. He was getting people out and helping a lot. He saved a lot of lives. So naturally we're gonna get on the list at some stage. So he, you left your aunt and uncle's house after the two weeks and went where? Uh, we, we came to the UK okay. and left my father. And your dad stayed behind because he wanted to save people? Well, no, because he wouldn't have been left up. He, if he was on the plane, none of us would have left. Oh, got it. So he was working with the um, Red Cross and the United Nations, and they took his papers, and everyone knew the flight he was on, yeah. and that's where we, they were going to pick him up. Got Meanwhile, it. papers gone, and he was smuggled to Italy. Meanwhile, we're, we're in refugee camp in the UK. UK thinking is he alive right. um, what's happening what's going on and also we're alive and how does this work sure. and it was like totally so eventually um, well he phoned up he's alive he's in Italy we've got nothing anymore we lost everything now what how do we survive you know we'd never heard of things like social security as far as we were concerned we had nothing yeah. we're going to be out of here at some stage with no father no money we're on the streets what's going on it was and at the airport i remember my father put his hand on my shoulder and said you're the man of the family now you have to take care of your mother and brother yeah. so on the plane it was hysterical there were people in whatever languages crying and wailing and praying and God knows what. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to take care of them? Where are we going to land? Where are we going to eat? Where are we going to sleep? What's sure. going on? So it was, I guess it was a bit of a life sentence that I, I, I took on board quite happily because, well, obviously I am. I'm, I'm the eldest son. It's, it's the normal thing, yeah. I guess. And so now you're in the UK? Yeah, um, refugee camps. And about nine months later, my father came over to the UK. And um, we moved into a small town in Wales um, because it was a Catholic community. We were brought up Catholic and it was safe and small and familiar in the home. Sure. And they'd never seen colored people before. Yeah. Um, so it was a bit weird all around. And we'd never been in a street. It was a council house in the street. We'd never played in the street. Sure. We'd never, it was just like landing on a different planet. Meanwhile, some of the kids thought if my father gets angry because we're from Africa, he might eat them. 
um, other people heard that we were Indian. So they, th I remember some kids looking under the city and behind stuff and my father said, what are you looking for? And they said, well, where do you keep your bows and arrows? So we were from another planet yeah. um, holding on to a lot that yeah. people wouldn't get. And also, I think as a family, we were so holding it together that we didn't talk about stuff because if one cracks, everyone might crack. Yeah. So it was survival. And it wasn't the people were absolutely amazing. The way that I remember we were going to move down the road because the house was in better nick, it was in better repair. And our next door neighbors said, we don't want you to move. We want you to stay next door to us. So we'll redecorate your house and show you how to cook and stuff. Never cooked, never cleaned, never been shopping or anything. We were starting from scratch. Right. So it was a good, though slightly weird, childhood yeah. Yeah. because it's like from one planet to trauma. So and I'm then what did your dad do here to make money at that point? Um, there was nothing. At one stage he went door to door um, in the local town saying, I need a job so I can earn money and feed my family. Right. And apparently his first work paid him less than the social security, but he needed to keep his sanity and his dignity. So he just started working and we all, we acted normally, you know, I guess all my life I have just wanted to be normal, invis invisible, um, so nothing to say, it's like fit in and, and you know. Let's make it work. Exactly, exactly. So, so then what do you do? You, you grow up, let's fast forward, you're 20 years old now, what are you doing? So I moved, um, I moved to England, I studied, I had a successful business, marketing, PR, design, music business, blah, blah, blah. It was good, I did well. And every few years, I would need to change job or move home because I had this thing at the back of my head that someone's after me. Some, you know, as soon as I do well, they're gonna because right, right, that's what you experienced. Today. Exactly. Right. So that was my my dialogue that kept going. Yeah. On. No, that's a good point. So my dad lost everything when I was like 13, and so I'm extremely fearful of losing everything. Yeah, that's exactly where I was. Right. If I make any more, right. then I could lose it all, and that's okay. Right. But if I lose it all, will I be able to do it again? I don't even want to think about doing it. I'll just not make enough yeah, right. so I'm safe. Sure. I'll not be that, so I kept, and I did, I did very well. Right. So I had to keep skipping career, changing career, moving town, etc. Yeah. And my last business was magnificent and it did very well. What was it? Uh, marketing and publicity. Right. I worked with everyone I wanted to work with. I had the best clients, the best staff. I lived in the most perfect warehouse. I was supposed to marry my girlfriend, etc., etc. All my dreams came true. And then through coincidences, I moved to Fiji. And then I moved, I was headhunted to Australia and I traveled for five years. And I came back and I learned, I mean, even crossing borders, it's like the flashbacks I had were outrageous. It was really scary, but I needed to get over it. And there's a part of me that was looking for a home. I was looking for belonging. I was looking for a time and place that no longer existed. So um, yeah, I was out and about. I came back to England and I had very close friends my male friends were like it was a brotherhood but I came back and they were different it's like I'd been traveling and adventuring and I'd had a great time you, had a more open, you were more open-minded and they were more into workaholism alcoholism drugs sex whatever and it was just busy it was far too busy I couldn't meet them at, at a depth that I needed so one day I got about 18 of them or 12 of them or whatever in my lounge and I said to them okay I've never been to a men's group I don't know what a men's group is but we're gonna start one and I need to meet at some depth I need you guys to be real so I can be real I the superficial stuff it's like I'm over it and if you can't meet me there you're chucked which was the beginning that was like I don't know 13 years ago and some still come to the groups and some carried on with their money addiction or sure, their sure. girl addictions or whatever but as it goes it's, it's like, like different I have different I have an obstacle addiction uh, uh, really? addiction yeah what with your sports <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> 
I used to have a love addiction. I used to, you know, need people to love me right. and that would help me feel safe. And I guess, but the Oedipal complex, you know, the mother son thing, it was like, I was so used to being loved. Sure. But as soon as women came so close, it's, oh my God, I'm going to be smothered to death. I need to well, run. How, how does somebody out there that's listening know None of us are perfect, that's a given. But how does somebody out there know that it's, it's worth exploring a little more deeply that maybe they've got something they should work on? Do you know, for me, it's not even what's up that needs to be fixed. It's more what more do you want out of life right. and what's in the way. So for me, it's about moving forward rather than let's find something or stuck with something. I mean, if there is a fear of, I don't know, success or money or relationships or whatever, and people know that, then obviously that's, that's a place to start. But it's for me about just being present and conscious and aware and taking part in life rather than overly um, competitive or underly, you know, hiding. Sure. So it's for people who want more out of life. And the people that come to the groups are not all, you know, with a huge issue. Right. It's They're not necessarily broken, but, but, um, but it does give you the opportunity to explore and... and if right. it's up, if it's there. But a place to hang out. And I feel, especially with men, um, it's easy to be doing. But well, we all get caught up in it, right? And it's yeah. great. Yeah. And I need a space for being as well. And when I go to the groups, even when I work with clients, it's like it's a sacred space where we can be real and see what's up. But with the groups, it's a space for me to not only be me and chill out and come from that, that, that piece, but it's also to get to know who I really am over and above automatic personalities that might show off sure. or survive somehow. So it's like, so what's going on? Who am I now after last week, after my wife's last um, menstrual cycle? How did I survive that? After my, wife, my mother's eye operation, after my brother's this or my friend's that and after whatever's going on, sure. who am I and how am I, how am I meeting life? Am I giving it my best? Is there something in the way? And I would rather learn from other people's mistakes any day of the week than be separate and have to learn it all myself. No, I'll take the easy way out. <laughs> yeah, man. I really enjoyed that one. I really, I love it when people uh, are giving the advice that you need to first get to know yourself before before you can you know get lost in the busyness of the world what did you think oh yeah it, 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 go ahead Jeffrey no um in, in permaculture it's called zone zero zero right before like you design zero, landscape zero. around you you need to kind of make sure your inner landscape is calm and sorted and that's something that I work on you know I know like Johnny leads in meditation and things like to find that inner calmness that's definitely something I would like to get more proficient at because I, I realize when people who do cultivate and have that it really shows in all of their outward expressions and and you can tell when someone's centered and grounded I've been called a, a leafy vegetable my whole life <laughs> I've been told, I've been told I need more, to put down some roots I would say I'm the opposite end of the spectrum if somebody's like really tuned in and calm and has their stuff together I'd be good at like disrupting their life yeah <laughs> that's why that's why we all we hang all, out with you Joe <laughs> but, but, but we do need all, all sorts Right? right and um and so the the group that he's attracted and he's put together these uh these men's workshops also does one-on-one -on -one coaching and it's helping people who as he said they've got all the boxes ticked in their life right they've got the success they've got the family they've got the car they've got the business and yet they're not fulfilled they're not happy and he said that we all have some story something along the way i think he said it's, it's the lie that we're surviving and um and for him as a, as a refugee as a child it was this whole thing about i need to keep moving i need to keep moving and so he lived on the surface and one day he said I'm going to stop. I'm going to go deeper. I'm going to find out more about myself and I'm going to demand that of the people around me. And so he said, I need my friends to meet me at depth. And I love that expression, the idea about to not just live on the surface like so many people do and they stay busy with accomplishments, but they never really find out who they are, right? Yeah. So, um, so I think you're very good at, at, at yanking people out of their complacency and, and, and disrupting. And I think quite often, the experience I've had here in the woods is, you know, 50, 60 hours in a race, I find out things about myself that I didn't come here even to find out about. Yeah. So it's a different way to get there. But I think that one of the things that he said um, 
if I actually I'll read between the lines a little bit. We've talked about um, how women are disadvantaged in society in so many ways, the expectations and things like that. And yet, in some ways, boys and men are very disadvantaged by the fact that we're supposed to be tough and strong and boys don't cry and, uh, and suck it up buttercup, right? And the idea that it's perfectly acceptable for a woman to share their emotions, especially with friends, and yet guys don't. I've actually found in the death race community some of the toughest, most sensitive Mike Patrizo guys in the world who are these big animal guys who are so sweet, right? Or sure. Patrick Walsh or Kevin Lowe, a monster of a person, just yeah. the yeah. kindest Teddy person. Day. But I think it's because we've been exposed to a situation where we don't have to prove our masculinity out there. I mean, we're, we're out there doing tough stuff, but we're actually breaking ourselves down to the point where we can go to depth. But the best MMA fighters or wrestlers, I'm always I'm always shocked when you meet them. They are, they're pussycats. They're yeah. the nicest guys, right? Yeah. And I, but I think, and you correct me, if I'm wrong because you come from a wrestling background or even military guys I, I think it comes from this um, place where they, they don't have any ego because they've lost they've been at battle right I think you dropped the ego yeah not, not all I've certainly been around a lot of wrestlers and whatnot who, who are still stuck in that ego space but you're absolutely right a lot of the ones who've gotten to that level they don't need to prove that anymore right, right. And, um, but, but I do think that what he says about the idea that it's very very important for us to stop living on the surface and start leaning in and actually living on the edge of life, being present, showing up, being aware in all of our relationships and everything that we're doing and actually being there instead of in our head thinking, what's this mean? How do, how's this going to appear to people? Right. And, um, and that once you drop that story, you know, you, you, you referred to the fact that, you know, your dad went broke and you were 13, probably a lot of what informs your work ethic where you got to work, 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 because it can always be pulled away. He talked about moving, 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 because they might always be coming to get them. And um, to, to have the presence of mind to stop and say, what is it? What's the, what's my uh, overriding program that controls how, how I am in life? And how can I actually stop letting that drive me? It's not, not that it's script. a bad thing. Your script, exactly. That's yeah. what I was looking for, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's a bad thing, but it's to understand it and make sure that it isn't to your detriment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think people like, people like this guy and people like Joe actually fit well. Re they fit really well together because... Joe is disrupting people, and then uh, Kenny. Kenny. Kenny is uh, trying to bring people back to their center, mm -hmm. and I think you're both trying to accomplish the same goal. Yeah. Just by complete, just by opposite means. Joe, you're trying to break people down to the point where they find out what their center is, and Kenny is trying to. I don't know, get people to just look inside uh, without that kind of pain stimulus to bring them there. Um, but you're all, uh, and I think that people who have found their center do very well in an endurance race. True story. Uh, in life. In, yeah, in life, in a, even in a death race. I haven't done one, but I imagine. You did, um, you did yeah. one this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Um, if you have that center, you can pretty much go through anything. I, I, like, I like the way you put it, too, that um, most people live in the mushy middle, and they just want to stay there, make it simple, make it easy, let's not make it complicated, just let me live in this really vanilla place that I don't have to do anything. You're good at grabbing them, throwing them out of the boat, going, yeah, no, you're in the waves, swim. <laughs> That's right? right. Yeah. He's good at once they get to shore, <laughs> say, saying, hey. Yeah, let's talk about things. Yeah, <laughs> in, in, instead, of, instead of just going right back to that mushy middle. So you guys are both working to the same goal, which is to cause people to actually look at what's important and find meaning. You just have different methods. You'd be a great team. It's the dash that counts, the dash in yeah, the middle, sure. right? Exactly. Between, between birth date and end date. It's yep. that dash that matters. What are you going to do with it? Yep. If you want to do something with the dash, Can tune in, check out Spartan Up the Podcast, join the conversation, watch, the old, um, watch some of the old episodes, and, uh, and join us. Thank you for listening to another epic story of success. To find more show notes, lessons, audio, video, and everything Spartan, please visit us at spartan.com slash podcast. The Spartan Up Podcast is brought to you by Spartan. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com. If you like our message, please help us get the word out. Tell your friends about Spartan Up and go ahead and subscribe on iTunes or YouTube, wherever you watch or listen to the show. Oh.